Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and welcome back to Projections, our show about virtual reality and augmented reality. Well, today we're gonna to talk about the concept of haptics, about the sense of touch, and how you might get that sense of touch in the virtual reality experiences that you're using today and in the future. Uh, today, in the controllers that we use with our VR systems, whether it's the Oculus Touch controller, or the HTC Vive controller, or the Index controller, you have you have basic haptics. We have things like vibration motors and you have linear actuators that give you approximations for the type of feelings that you might get for things you might do. For example, uh, you might get a little vibration when you pull the trigger of a virtual gun or if you're pulling back a bow and arrow, you might get some feedback as well from those vibration motors. But of course, it's not exactly what you feel when you're doing those actual activities in the real world. And a bunch of different companies are experimenting with ways to bring that sense of touch into consumer devices and enterprise devices. We've seen things like gloves that you wear, seen custom designed controllers with custom designed motors, but it turns out haptics is a pretty complicated topic. Uh, one company that's working on their own haptic solution, they've been doing it for a while now, is called HaptX, and they brought their solution, their version of a haptic solution, to our studio where I got to use it. There are these gloves that you put on, and I chatted with their CEO about just haptics in general and how they think about them. Let's go check it out. So I'm super excited to have Jake, co-founder CEO of Haptex here Thanks in our studio. Me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing this setup. We've heard a lot about your haptic solution. Uh, these gloves you guys have been developing for a very long time now. Um, and I got a chance to try them just now, but I'm so curious about the technology behind this. Uh, before we get into exactly how it works, I love the First, define some terms, mm -hmm. right? Haptics, I think, is a very broad idea in, in VR and in you know control controllers. Otherwise, uh, we have you know vibration controllers and video game controllers. We have we've seen VR systems provide some type of mechanical pushback resistance, mm -hmm. um, sensation. How do you think about haptics? Yeah, so we've done a lot of thinking about haptics over the years and a lot of testing and characterization of, um, of human responses to haptics. And what we found is that it breaks down into a couple of key categories. And you have to have all of them together to get a sensation of natural and realistic touch. So those categories are, first off, force feedback. So this is what um, you think about when you look at the resistance or the rigidity of objects. It's actually stopping your fingers from penetrating through a solid object and providing a gross force on your fingers. There's some systems that even have large exoskeletons and actually provide forces on your arms, mostly mm -hmm. in, a, in a research setting. Um, so that's enough to give you sort of a vague sense of the overall property uh, properties of objects and the receptors in your body that let you know um, what an object's rigidity is are largely in your muscles and in your ligaments in your hand. Um, where you really have the vast majority of receptors in your skin though um, is actually uh, you know, on, along the surface of your skin. And that's what lets you know the texture, the shape, the contact pressure, um, the movement of objects. And that's most of what we use as humans to do fine motor control and dexterous tasks. Um, and that's part of what's so unique about our system is we don't just do the gross force feedback. We actually do um, fine tactile feedback as well. So Which we have which is the um, basically deforming the skin, providing mm. pressure against the skin. So let me give a practical example of this to make it, make it easier to grasp the difference. Let's say I grab a ball. Um, the resistance that keeps my hand from penetrating into that ball, that's force feedback. The actual feeling of the ball pressing against my fingers, the shape, the roundness of the ball, the movement of the ball, if I'm moving it or throwing it, um, that's all coming from your skin, from what we call tactile feedback. Um, and the last ingredient that, that goes into uh, haptics, although it's not necessarily haptics per se, is motion tracking. You know, we talk a lot about motion tracking in the context of, of VR and motion capture. And uh, for haptics in particular, you need a very, very high level of precision. Um, because if you think about it, you know, when you do this on a real object and you touch it very lightly, what's the difference between you, you know, touching it like that and touching it like that? You right. can barely see that movement because it's about a millimeter or two of motion of my finger. Right. If you can't capture that difference in the virtual environment, then all your haptics are useless because you won't be able to differentiate between, say, a light touch and a heavy touch. And so, For all three of those requirements, VR traditionally has done a pretty poor job. At least we're very far from getting there. The controllers that we have on our consumer VR headsets, they have positional tracking for where our hands are, mm. but 
you know, you don't have a ton of analog control. You have some analog feedback in terms of how much you've gripped, and some new controllers do that as well, but it's vibration, really. You get no full resistance, and the touch feedback is simulated through vibration, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are you guys doing all of that? So I'll talk about it one by one. So first off, for motion tracking, as you mentioned, there are a lot of consumer systems that are increasingly doing some amount of, of, of finger tracking. You look at the new index controllers, for example, and um, you know, Valve has done a great job of finding a happy medium, something that's a low-cost, effective solution for consumers. And that's great at you know, animating your fingers and giving you a greater sense of immersion, but that's nowhere near what you need for haptics. So mm -hmm. we actually use an electromagnetic solution. Um, we have um, a little emitter. It's basically a, a coil um, of wire, an electromagnet in the glove that creates a magnetic field around the glove. It's a very small field, so it really doesn't go much beyond the glove, which prevents interference, which you typically would see with other magnetic systems. And then we have a little sensor about the size of a grain of rice, very, very small in each finger. And that's another set of coils of wire that pick up the strength of that field. Um, and because of just the physics of electromagnetics, we can get very, very high levels of precision, as low as a, a tenth of a millimeter or so in, in many cases. Um, and that's what gives you that very high fidelity motion capture that you saw in the demo, which again is not haptics per se, but it's a prerequisite to get the sort of sensation that, uh, that you want. So as opposed to the, the finger poses that you get on like the next controller where it can approximate and it kind mm -hmm. of abstracts the distance from the, the cap sense, positions, here you have very precise exactly where the fingers are relative to each other, that positional information, and then you combine that with you know the temporal movement for how fast your fingers are moving, yep. and that then feeds back to how strong or how what something should feel like. We have a lot of secret sauce on the software side as well in terms of how the hand is modeled. You'll notice that we measured your hand. Right now yeah. we're doing that manually. In the future that'll be fully automated where we can just look at some hand poses and extrapolate the size of your hand. Uh, we feed that into a very accurate biomechanical um, model of the musculature and the bones and skin in your hand. And that's what determines how the data from these sensors actually ends up as a hand pose. And then when you contact a 3D object in the environment, we take the contact data from the game engine, but all the physical simulation of skin deformation is done in our own custom physics engine, effectively. Um, and that's what figures out, let's say you're grabbing one of the rocks in the demo, um, the little bumps that you can actually feel on your hand, that comes from us figuring out, okay, here's what the surface of that mesh looks like. Here, if that mesh was to contact your real skin, is how much it would deform. And then we command and this very dense array of, of pixels, effectively, tactile pixels, to make that same shape in your hand. Yeah, so we're jumping ahead right now. Yes. We're talking about the motion, the motion tracking, sorry, which, got, is, gotten which is the into, input, yeah, right, got, right? The motion tracking is the input, yes. Right. So, you brought, so we've talked about motion tracking. I guess I just segued into the tactile feedback, which yeah. again, you know, we think of from our experimentation as the most critical component. It's the one that you least often find in um, any sort of VR system because it's the hardest to do. Your skin yeah. is very sensitive. And we found that you need um, about 130 points or so, which is what we have in this glove, to um, really produce a convincing um, sensation of touch and motion and texture on the hand. We were talking about that earlier, right? All the variables you're taking into account. You're talking about resolution. Mm -hmm. You say 130 of these little little pads that are in touch and you very judiciously place for the fingertips, for the multiple places in mm -hmm. your palm. That's based on your research for where people would normally feel the most exactly. when they pick up objects, when they interact with objects. Yeah, so we have, you know, we actually have a, a couple of biomedical engineers that have worked for years on this glove technology, and you might think it's a little bit of an, an odd fit because, you know, this is you know, a, a mechanical device, but a lot of the work we do is actually thinking about the human hand and the human body. Yeah. So we did a lot of uh, research and perceptual testing on the resolution and perception of, of tactile uh, stimuli on the skin. And there's, you, know, you can go find a research paper and get things like the two-point threshold, you know, how, how sensitive the skin is on paper, but that changes a lot in the actual use of your hand in real environments. So we've done thousands of hours of testing uh, with people using this very system um, to try and figure out where to best place these points, how to lay them out on the hand, how to make it move with you as you move, as you move your hand. You'll notice that all these panels have very specific shapes, and that's because they fit um, on your hand. So this guy, for example, fits right. here, which allows okay. you to retain motion while having this contact your skin. So a surprising amount of the work on making the tactile system work comes down to ergonomics and human factors. How do you make it comfortable? How do you make it fit your hand? How do you make it move with you? And these panels then, so resolution I get, right? That's mm -hmm. gonna be how dense of, of these pressure points can you put yeah. in. Then the other variables are then how strong these points mm -hmm. can be, how much actual pressure, and also 
um, your, how much actual indentation, what, what the actual distance of movement is. So your skin behaves like a spring. Essentially, the more pressure you apply, the more it deforms. And that's one of the hardest parts of designing a system like this is because um, your skin actually moves quite a bit. If you push into it, you can see it's not a rigid surface at all. Yeah, it moves yeah. several millimeters. And most actuator technologies that you use for haptics, like, for example, an electric motor, like a vibrating motor, for example, or a uh, linear resonant actuator that you'd find in a VR controller, they can, they can only move um, a fraction of a millimeter up and down. Um, and so to really get good tactile sensation, you not only need something very dense, you can see in this array, but you also need something that can move up and down by several millimeters. And particularly when you think about it in relation to the height of the actuator, um, the level of strain, the level of motion relative to size is huge. And it's way beyond what you can get with other types of actuators. And, and you that, can control moving half we can millimeter, control, exactly. a millimeter. Yep. I mean, you have footage where these bumps are they're basically kind of ebbing and flowing exactly. based on what it's simulating. Um, and you know, when we think of like a vibration controller, we always talk about like the frequency. Mm -hmm. how, how, they can, how fast can you change it? Can you also have high frequency as well? We can. So, so what's so cool about the system, we've developed um, a very sensitive pressure controller. And I've got one right here that I can show you. Basically, this is what's in the box. This is what makes everything work. Um, and we've been on a quest to miniaturize this technology over the years. We started, as some of our, our earliest followers may have seen, in 2016 with a ridiculous box the size of a refrigerator. It gave you great sensation, but it was completely impractical form factor. And back then, each pressure controller was an off-the-shelf device that was you know, that big. And that's why it was a 200-pound box. Today, we've gotten that down to this. Um, we still have a lot more room for miniaturization. So I can't talk about precise details, but I can say that in our next generation system, uh, it will be a lot smaller still than what you have here. And eventually we see a clear roadmap to getting this into a wearable form factor and integrating it into um, perhaps into the gloves themselves. Uh, but this technology allows us to control airflow with enormous levels of precision in just a few milliseconds. Um, and that means we can fill each of these bubbles with a very precisely controlled amount of air and thus control the amount of, of inflation. Mm. There's a lot of software and controls magic that's going on to do that, but basically when our SDK on the software side touches, you know, your hand touches the 3D model and it says, okay, that ridge looks like this, there's a series of steps where that's being commanded to a pressure in the valve, and that's then creating a displacement of your skin, a uh, displacement of this bubble against your skin that's equivalent to or very close to what it would be if there was a real object touching your hand. That's why we get so much realism, because again, we're make, basically making the shape of a real object in your skin. The, the sensation is not being simulated at all. It's actually a physical motion of your skin. It's merely the object that's being simulated. And these valves, you said there's 144 of them? There's 144 independent valves in this box. And are they distributed evenly? or are they they're, they're prioritized in different they're ways? They're prioritized in different ways. So um, we have uh, different amounts of valves dedicated to the fingers. We have different levels of resolution on different fingers. So for example, your index finger is used much more in manipulation than your pinky is. Yeah. So we have very different levels of resolution on the index finger and pinky. Uh, across your palm, resolution varies from um, the uh, distal part of your palm um, to the proximal part of your palm near, near your arm. And uh, so we have resolution that starts higher here and goes lower here. Um, there's all kinds of, I mean, again, we spent a lot of time fine tuning this. And we want to try and use as few valves as possible because each of these obviously has a cost and we're bringing that down significantly as we, as we scale up. But, you know, it's more efficient to use as few as possible to get the best possible sensation. I mean, there's definitely this mechanical engineering problem of miniaturization that you need yep. to solve in getting this system to work. But then also there's material sciences. Yep. problem. Are you guys happy with where these are in terms of the materials you're using and the, the silicones you're using so that you get that kind of we're, we're very happy with that. The, the point of this development kit system is not to be a mass market product. This is something we've had a couple of dozen companies around the world in, um, in aerospace, automotive, medical, um, government, and uh, industrial applications piloting this. And in the process, we're collecting a lot of data about how this performs and, you know, is it meeting their needs? And, yeah. you know, by and large, the feedback we've gotten on the fundamental technology, the level of fidelity, the quality of tracking has been, has been excellent. Um, across the board. The biggest problems that we have left to solve to, to take this to really a volume product come down to fairly mundane things that nonetheless take some engineering effort. Things like sizing. People have different sized hands. Right now we have one size of gloves. We're not going to launch a production product with one size of gloves. Right. Um, miniaturizing the box. You know, right now it's useful for seated and standing applications, but with our production version we plan to support you know, room scale mobility like you would see with the HTC Vive. And of course that requires a smaller box. So these are all things I can't talk about exact details, but I can say 
um, you know, we will be uh, announcing a new version of the system in the relatively near future that will um, have a lot of those improvements or at least a path to a lot of those improvements that I'm talking about. And that's about. where the effort is now. You guys are pretty locked in in terms of, you know, you'll want the sensors on the fingers and the yep. palms, and that's where the focus is. There will be, in, in our next couple of generations of product, there will be no changes to the fundamental technology. We're very happy with, you know, this, this performs great. It's got a good life. It's, you know, got very high fidelity. It's actually cheap to produce these panels right now. It blows now. my mind. I can see the individual channels. And yeah. You're, you're pumping air in at, at you know some psi at how many times a second through that and I can I can feel it interact in real time. It's it's, cool. it's a lot of complexity I and mean, that's why it's taken us so long to this point. You know, I almost feel bad for people that have been watching us and cheering us on for years. And I really appreciate the level of support we've gotten from the VR community and I, I want to give them a product they can have with their their Vive or their Oculus Rift today. But the reality of a complex harbor product like this, you know, really solving a problem like haptics, giving people what we've promised, which is realistic touch, is you know, we can we can do it for you in a demo today, but the path to getting that to market at scale takes time, yeah. particularly at a price point that's acceptable for the consumer market. You know, we've been very open about the fact that right now we are not a consumer company. We, you know, I, I'm very committed personally to the consumer market. I love consumer VR. It was the, the genesis of this vision. And I'm very confident that we will eventually bring this down to a consumer price point. But it's going to take a couple of years for us to do that. In the meantime, we are very focused on our enterprise customers who have been, you know, fantastic early adopters for this technology and have been the ones that have allowed us to actually bring this to market. Without them, you'd never get a consumer version of this because there'd be no one to fund it. Absolutely. <laughs> one more thing I do want to talk about because we did talk about input. We talked about the tactile feedback. Yep. We didn't talk about the force feedback. That's right. So the force feedback um, on our system is uh, done very similarly to the, the tactile feedback. We actually use a pneumatic actuator to essentially clamp down on a tendon. Mm. So it's, you know, there are other, other systems out there that give you finger force feedback. There are other gloves. Ours is not really that different. Um, it's because of the pneumatics, you get a much higher power density um, and a higher level of performance across the board than you would with a, an electromechanical device. Um, but the, really the secret sauce for our glove, I would say, is the tactile feedback. That's what's the most unique component what the most important component is. The force feedback exists essentially to support that. If you turn off the force feedback, which we can do, we do by the way, and show you what that feels like, um, everything still feels real, but it feels kind of like almost a balloon animal version of itself. There's no stiffness, there's no rigidity. You still get the, the sensation on your skin, but there's nothing to stop your fingers. Right. Um, so really all this is is essentially a break. It stops your fingers at the right time so that when you experience the tactile sensation, it's where your brain thinks the surface of the object should be and not inside of the object, which breaks that illusion of realism. Yeah, and you guys don't use enough PSI to make it like fully rigid to where it's painful. I'm not never feeling like no, a pinprick so, on this. So it's the, it's the relative sensation. There are two very different types of force feedback devices in the industry. We refer to them as passive and active. A passive device is basically a break. It stops your finger or your arm or whatever else you're, you're actuating. Um, and uh, that is inherently safe. So there's nothing, this cannot apply any force to you. It is merely resisting the force you apply to it, mm. which means we can't tear your finger off. In an active system, you have something like a motor that actually pulls on your finger, pulls on your arm. And those have some advantages. They can allow you to do things like, for example, if you're simulating pushing on something that's actually doing work on your fingers, moving them and applying a force to them at the same time, you can do that with an active system. You can't with a passive system, uh, but at the cost of something that's much bigger, more complex, and has big safety concerns. So, right. you know, we built in our early days, we built some big exoskeletons, like for your legs and for your arms. And the amount of work we had to go through to make sure it was safe to put a person in something that was physically capable of tearing your leg off, for example. It, ensured that it would never really come to market as a, as a feasible product. And so we quickly ended up gravitating more toward a passive architecture where we don't have to worry about hurting someone. There's nothing in this system that is physically capable of hurting you unless you, you know, drop it on your head, for example. That's super interesting. Clearly, you guys have done a lot of thinking about haptics, about force feedback, about tactile feedback. That's pretty much all we think about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for the past seven years, I can't wait to see what you guys are going to do next. And thank you so much for bringing thank us you. in. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, so that was a lot of information to take in. My first big takeaway is that my eyes were really open to just how complex the problem of haptics in a VR controller really is. Now, I thought haptics was about force feedback, about giving you resistance, but it's resistance along with uh, the feeling of touch on the tips of your fingers, at your nerve endings, along with things like pain and temperature, things that we even talk about in the in our interview. Well, how does the haptics controller work? Uh, if it wasn't clear from our conversation, uh, underneath the gloves that I was wearing, uh, at the tips of your fingers, they have 
these panels. And on each of these panels are a series of these tiny, essentially think of them as, as air pockets, these little bubbles. They call them tactors. And the panels are then connected through a channel system through that big cable into this box that's on the table. Inside this box is about 144 of these valves. These proprietary designed valves are very small, very quiet, and then compressed, uh, connected to an air compressor, which then pumps air in. Now they have software that then takes a look at what you're interacting with in the virtual environment, and then based on that, they model what your hand should be feeling because uh, the glove is then calibrated to your hand so that those tactors are positioned exactly where they think your fingertip should be, where your palm is, because every hand's gonna have a different size, and then the valves start opening and closing really quickly to send that air into the tips of your fingers so that these little tactors, these little air bubbles, inflate and deflate really quickly, giving you the sensation of touch at your fingertips. That combined with the force feedback system, which is these ribbons behind each of the fingers, which then are tied to a breaking mechanism that breaks so it prevents your fingers, these your tendons, from then bending forward, then give you that sensation of that you're pushing against an object or that you're holding something or that you're, you're manipulating or something's walking across your hand. Now, from the experience demo I got, uh, super interesting and very compelling. Uh, the first thing I did in this virtual environment, I was standing in front of a miniature, like a, a farmscape. There was a barn, there was a tiny tractor, there was a field of wheat, and then there was, uh, there was also some rain clouds. I put my hand underneath the rain clouds, and the rain fell onto my hand. And that's where it felt super convincing. The tiny tractor started inflating, and I felt a little bit of pressure right on the top of my fingertips, as well as on my palm. The precision was really good, the latency was really good because there's a lot of mechanisms happening to get this to work, from the air being compressed, the valves opening, to then the bubbles inflating, but it was effective. The same with later on in the demo when there, were, uh, there was a spider walking on my finger or a tiny fox walking on my palm. The feet of these tiny creatures really felt like they were there. It's almost really creepy. I, I love those experiences. Uh, but what about feeling the objects in the environment as well, picking up the rocks or putting up my hand against the barn. The force feedback worked. Of course, it wasn't gonna prevent my entire arm from pushing forward. There was no ribbon cable here on my elbow, but it prevented my fingers from pushing forward, so giving me enough of resistance there to let me know something was supposed to be there, but did it feel like a solid plane? And that's where I felt like large objects, big, big surface areas, the, the contiguousness of these, these tactors wasn't completely convincing. Now I know it's supposed to be, because they've done all the research on this idea of a two-point threshold. That's how close two points of pressure have to be to convince a human brain that it's one continuous object, you know, depending on the density of nerves on your fingertips. And they believe the density of these tactors as they've designed them on your fingertips and your palm are close enough. The resolution of the tactors is large enough to allow you to simulate a solid object. But maybe it's because of the way the valves are opening and closing and that the pressure was constantly changing. Even when I was pushing my hand against the flat surface of the barn or on that environment there, it still felt like a bunch of little pressure points pushing up my hand. To be clear, it felt like there was something there, but it never felt like it was one solid object. The second demo I did was also really interesting. This was in uh, the virtual cockpit, in the driver's seat essentially, of a virtual car, which was beautifully modeled. And not only modeled visually, but there was a lot of interaction points here as well. The buttons were pushable, the levers that could move up and down, you could even move the sunshade down, and the steering wheel I could actually grab, which would activate the force feedback to prevent my fingers from closing fully, and also feel that steering wheel on my fingers. And here, while the steering wheel, again, never felt like one fully solid object, it still felt like tiny bits of pressure pushing against my palm and my fingertips, I was able to close my eyes and actually turn the steering wheel as you normally do and feel the points of pressure change, shift from the tips of my fingers to the palm as I was turning. And that actually allowed me to feel like I could actually drive with this, with this haptic feedback, without actually physically holding something real. That was really compelling.
And I could really see this being useful in simulations because there is potential for this to then help me build muscle memory for repetitive tasks, for learning actions, as opposed to not getting that physical feedback, that touch feedback in doing those actions. Now, all of this, of course, is to say that this is a system, as you could see, that's an enterprise solution right now. This is not something that's made for the home or even location-based experiences. I know the Haptics folks have said that they are working on miniature, miniaturizing all of this into maybe getting all of those valves into something you could wear on your body, but you're still gonna need some type of connected device to an air compressor. Um, so it's for, it's for tethered VR for the foreseeable future. It's even then, even if they can get this into something I could wear, I, I do think it's an important part of haptics. I don't know if they've solved 100% that problem of the idea of feeling something, a solid object, um, you know, whether it's a cup or whether it's a wall uh, in a virtual environment the, to the point where I could be completely convinced, eyes closed, that that's, what, that's the object. It's definitely the closest I felt to having that type of haptics experience uh, in VR. But I don't know if this is the technology that's going to get us there. But I do want to thank them for bringing the whole system here. It's super interesting. They're working on all sorts of haptic experiments and beyond EVR. They have telepresence, robot control with their haptics gloves. And I wish them the best in the future. And I can't wait to see what they do with their technology. Uh, but we'll have more coverage on VR technology like this and on software as well in the future. Thanks for watching the show. And we'll see you next time.